welcome to the AVF podcast. I am Jeff Paolo, your host for this edition of ICU Tips and Tricks. Our guest is Dr. Domenico Luca Greco of the Department of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care of the Policlinico Universitario Agostino Gemelli in Rome, Italy. Dr. Greco was the lead author this year in JAMA of the Henevot trial that compared helmet non-invasive ventilation with high-flow nasal cannula strategies and COVID-19 hypoxic respiratory failure. Accordingly, we will talk today about non-invasive respiratory support. So welcome, Dr. Greco, or Domenic, Domenico. It is great to meet you. Thank you. It is nice to meet you, and I'm delighted to join this nice podcast. And I think this is a wonderful initiative. Thanks Thank for you. inviting me. Well, we're very excited. I guess we can uh, begin with talking about the Hennebot trial itself. Could you tell us about that study? Uh, yes, absolutely. This is a, a story about COVID-19 because, mm, uh, let, let's say, we are working on hypoxemic respiratory failure since a while, and um, we are very interested in the use of the, the helmet because of possible advantages of this interface as compared to other interfaces for non-invasive ventilation, especially in the context of hypoxemic respiratory failure. These include essentially the possibility to deliver longer term treatments as compared to face mask. And on top of that, the possibility to provide high PEEP during spontaneous breathing. We have learned in, in the last decade, thanks to um, seminal studies conducted by um, Takeshi Oshida, Marcel Amato, and a large group of investigators that spontaneous breathing is harmful, but may be uh, made less harmful by the application of, of high P to stabilize recruitment, modulate the inspiratory effort, and prevent the pendulum phenomenon. This is why we tried to analyze the effect of helmet and non-invasive ventilation with specific settings um, as compared to what we consider and I think to date is the optimal strategy for um, administering oxygen for supplemental oxygen in the intensive care unit and outside, which is the high flow oxygen. Uh, high flow oxygen is a technique which is easy to use at the bedside, provides high flow of a gas mixture with uh, pre-specified oxygen fraction, which is fully heated and humidified. There are several advantages of the high flow oxygen. First of all, uh, the possibility to provide an FiO2, so the amount of oxygen that we want to provide and limit the dilution of the inhaled gas and the reduction in the alve alveolar FiO2. Second, the fact that patient expiration against a continuous flow in the nose mm, generates a flow-dependent uh, positive end expiratory effect, which somehow uh, generates a PEEP effect, so increased end expiratory lung volume, recruitment of dorsal regions, and improvement in oxygenation. And last but not least, the um, eye flow has the capability to wash out the upper airways by uh, from the CO2. And um, we have um, convincing data showing that in patients with apoxemic respiratory failure, in which the reduction of the inspiratory effort should be seen as a priority, the high flow nasal oxygen is capable of reducing the inspiratory effort without, cha without changing the PCO2. Essentially, it reduces the amount of minute ventilation needed for uh, achieving the CO2 target of the patient. So we think that in the last 10 years, the um, use of high flow oxygen, which was born in the um, pediatric context, has exploded in, in the adult intensive care units and with COVID-19 in the hospital wards. And mm -hmm. um, I think guidelines consider this kind of technique, the optimal strategy for the initial management of these patients. Also because there are conflicting results and there is no final evidence about the role of face mask NIV in patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure. Mm 
because the problem of hypoxemic respiratory failure is that patients who avoid intubation with the non-invasive support have a very good clinical outcome. But we have convincing data showing that with face mask and IV, um, the patients who are intubated after a trial of um, non-invasive ventilation with face mask, they suffer from a worsened clinical outcome. And this right. outcome is worsened by the delay in intubation, indicating that something occurs during the uh, spontaneous breathing. This has been well described by a um, seminal editorial by Laurent Brochard, Art, Art Slatsky, and Antonio Pesenti, in which they introduced the concept of patient self-inflicted lung injury. So in hypoxemic respiratory failure, we have a, mm, two priorities. One is try to avoid intubation, improve hypoxemia, but also to avoid that the intense inspiratory effort that sometimes that very often is mis, um, mis under evaluated in this context can generate further lung damage and worsen clinical outcome. In this context, we think that uh, the uh, NIV provided with the helmet is somehow different from NIV provided with face mask because the helmet allows to deliver mid moderate to high PEEP. And we have data showing that moderate to high PEEP allows to protect the lung from self-inflicted lung injury. So from the intense inspiratory effort, from the heterogeneity in transpulmonary pressure generating the pendulum phenomenon, and it, it also it is also capable of reducing the tidal volume because the inspiratory effort is lower. This is why we conducted yeah. the first physiologic study in which we compared what we believed is the gold standard treat treatment for these patients. So the eye flow with the helmet and IV, and this paper was published in the Blue Journal in like two years ago, one, one, one year and a half yes, ago. Yes. And we showed that uh, um, helmet and IV could have oxygenation reduce dyspnea, reduce the inspiratory effort without generating increases in transpulmonary pressure. We didn't have any information, unfortunately, on tidal volume. So we didn't know whether the application of pressure support on top of PEEP with NIV could generate increases in tidal volume. But we showed that the most benefit in terms of reduction of inspiratory effort was um, present in patients uh, who had a strong inspiratory effort during eye flow. So this led to the design of a randomized trial, which was the Hannibal trial, which originally was designed to include patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure due to all causes, not only COVID-19, right. but because of the pandemic, it ended up including patients in a very short time period, so two months in last um, uh, winter, and it was published in the JAMA, and 110 patients were randomized to receive either uh, high flow nasal oxygen alone, and in case of failure, endotracheal intubation, and the intervention harm received um, at least 48 hours of treatment with helmet and IV and the following settings. So PEEP, 12 centimeters of water, pressure support between 10 and 12, fastest pressurization time on the, on the, on the ventilator. FIU2 in both groups was adjusted um, to achieve the SPO2, SPO2 target that we wanted, so between 92 and 98%. In the helmet group, after weaning from helmet and NIV, uh, patients could receive, and almost all patients did receive eye flow nasal oxygen. So it's not properly a comparison between eye flow and helmet non-invasive ventilation. The research question we wanted to answer is that, provided that uh, the eye flow nasal oxygen is the uh, gold standard treatment for these patients, and we have inconsistent results from face mask and IV, do we, can we have a clinical benefit by adding in the first phase of the disease a more aggressive approach um, with IPEP and pressure support and IP with the, with the helmet. So it, it's not properly a comparison between two, two techniques, but it, it is a comparison between two strategies. One strategy is the eye flow alone, 
And the other strategy is the helmet for the first phase. And after, after the first phase is passed, so the patient is less hypoxemic, um, I flow for winning. In, 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 I flow for winning. We included patients with EF ratio below 200, so moderate to severe cases, but median PF ratio was around 100 millimeters of mercury, which, which means really severe patients. The primary endpoint of the study was a bit weird, honestly. There, there has been some criticism on this, but I, I understand. I agree. It's, it's a weird endpoint because it was the um, uh, proportion of days in which the patient um, breath uh, we, without any advanced respiratory support on a 28-day basis. And for this, we meant um, the proportion of days in which patients did not need invasive mechanical ventilation, non-invasive ventilation, or high flow oxygen. And although the amount of days was slightly higher in the helmet group, there was no statistical difference in the um, medium respiratory support three, three days in the two groups. But the, the, the most important secondary outcome was endotracheal intubation. So the proportion of patients who needed endotracheal intubation according to pre predefined criteria. And uh, on top of that, we try to be as rigorous as possible because we know that even if we set up predefined criteria, the decision to intubate is something which is left to the physician in charge. And uh, even with criteria, uh, we cannot rule out the possibility that there is a bias related to physician. And this is why we um, foresee, foresaw uh, um, valid, um, adjudication committee. So uh, all intubated patients where all, all the charts of intubated patients were reviewed a posteriori by three experts to establish that intubation had been performed according to the criteria of the protocol. And this was the case for all but one patients. And th this did not change the results on endotracheal intubation. And the results on the rate of endotracheal intubation were as follows. So we had a 30% incidence of need for endotracheal intubation in the helmet group versus 50%, so a 20% absolute difference, um, and five of number needed to treat to avoid intubation. Essentially, every five patients that we treated with helmet and IV, we could spare one patient endotracheal intubation, which is, to me, quite significant. Um, other secondary out outcomes included uh, um, ventilatory free days, uh, and this was significant in favor of the helmet non-invasive ventilation in uh, on a 28-day basis, and this result is mostly driven by uh, reduction in intubation rate. So essentially, uh, I think that uh, um, the eye flow should be considered um, the gold standard for this for the treatment of patients of, with hypoxemic respiratory failure for now. Um, we have con mm, somehow conflicting results about face mask and IV. And uh, um, uh, we know that uh, maybe it's not so performing well and maybe the eye flow is better alone. Mm -hmm. uh, we may have a benefit from helmet non-invasive ventilation in, term of, in terms of clinical outcome. But this, this comes from a secondary outcome of a small study, small multicenter study conducted in a um, very specific population. And I think these results should be replicated in a, on a larger scale. But indeed, there is a signal towards the benefit, of, finally, of helmet and non, for helmet non-invasive ventilation in the context of hypoxemic respiratory failure that warrants for further investigation. One, my, my one concern, uh, always when I try to speak with people who maybe are not so confident about um, the helmet, which is very common, because it, this is a technique which is really uh, not known um, abroad, uh, used in very specific settings. 
Italy, sometimes in the US, sometimes in France, but not very widespread. So I think that one um, advice is uh, in regards not only the helmet, but any kind of respiratory support, which is the monitoring of the patient. Because with any support you are providing, uh, the risk to delay intubation is present, and delaying intubation means worsening mortality. So once the patient is receiving eye flow, helmet NIV, face mask NIV, CPAP, any, any form of advanced respiratory support and PF ratio is below 200, the patient has to be closely monitored to detect the signs of treatment failure and provide endotracheal intubation. Please consider that the medium time that we have from randomization to endotracheal intubation in our study which includes the predefined criteria for intubation is about 30 hours. We have data coming from the US and a large scale data showing that if you delay intubation by 24 hours, 30 hours, because we are trying um, a non-invasive respiratory support trial, well, the effect on the outcome, the detrimental effect of the, the, on the outcome is quite limited. It may be present, but it's not so evident. So it is possible that uh, it, it is it wise to, 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 to give a try with the uh, non-invasive respiratory support. But delaying further, um, further uh, could, be, could be an issue because the risk is to, is to really uh, worsen clinical outcome. One advice could be not to go very high with the FIO2. For instance, mm -hmm. in our study, we did not use FIU2 greater than 60% because the concept is that if the patient needs FIU2 greater than 60%, it means that the PF ratio, so the ratio between PAU2 divided to um, FIU2 is likely below 100. If you have a persistent, not improving PF ratio below uh, 100, um, it is very likely that the patient may require endotracheal intubation. Uh, COVID-19 may be something a bit uh, different because we mm -hmm. know that some patients have silent hypoxia, the so-called silent hypoxia. So they uh, are quite hypoxemic, but uh, with very low PF ratio, but they don't perceive dyspnea nor are tachypneic. So no perception of fatigue, but a no uh, high respiratory rate. In that case, it could be acceptable to, to, to wait and see, but uh, please, in during any form of support, monitor your patients every three, six hours in terms of PF ratio. The SPF ratio is, 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 is fine, but SPF ratio, respiratory rate and dyspnea are three tools that should be part of the clinical monitoring of the patients are, are essential to avoid delays in endotracheal intubation that we know can worsen clinical outcome. This is very important because, especially in context in which the expertise on non-invasive respiratory support is not the same as the expert centers. So I would say if, if you want to give a try with non-invasive support, yes, this is fine, do it, but please monitor your patients and not do not delay endotracheal intubation from positioning and protective ventilation. Thank you. That was a lot of um, information already right there. And um, I think um, I myself have, um, I I'm so glad that you were able to um, express all those comments um, so succinctly because um, these are the kinds of questions that we have at bedside every day when we're um, debating whether or not to try and continue a little bit more on the non-invasive support or not. There's a little bit of bad news for Asia though, because um, the last time we did a little survey among ourselves, none of us were using the helmet um, non-invasive interface. I remember seeing it for the first time, maybe a decade ago in Hong Kong, but it was never really picked up by most centers. So right now it looks like most of the people here will be using high flow. Um, when high flow is not available, they'll be using the mask, uh, the face mask, um, non-invasive ventilation. I wonder what um, you think about that since we, if we do not have 
the helmet. Is there anything that you can tell us about um, face mask ventilation versus um, versus the high flow? Um, I think that it, once you are in the emergency situation, you use whatever you had, you have. Huh, okay? yeah, yeah, that's right. So whatever, whatever is you do, whatever is needed. Um, but uh, we have to. It, it is important that uh, the, there is knowledge that um, uh, NAV in any form can delay intubation. I think that um, we have data showing we have one single randomized trial, which is the Florali study, uh, published by the Reva Network, Champier Frat, uh, on the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015, that showed that in moderate to severe pa patients, so PF ratio below 200, which we understand. Uh, it's the most delicate population. So let's say one clinical advice could, could be the follow. Mm. When PF ratio is greater than 200, uh, I think that any form of support is fine. So you don't have to worry. Okay, so uh, high flow, low flow, um, you want to try CPAP is fine. Okay. Um, whatever you have, maybe also low flow oxygen is okay. Um, once the patient deteriorates below 200, this is the most delicate population. In that case, uh, there is that, that, that paper will show that high flow alone is better than high flow with intermittent sessions of, of face mask and AB. I think mm. that study was criticized a lot for a series of reasons, but I think that that, that is real life because in term, in face mask and IV is often delivered in intermittent sessions. And from that study, uh, maybe eye flow is not better, okay? But for sure, a face mask and IV alone is not, is not better. So if you have the two, I would suggest to go with the eye flow and with the eye flow and maybe prone the patient, okay? Right. So that could be a solution. So eye flow plus prone position, which is good. We have a um, recent meta trial sh showing that awake proning could mm, yield a significant reduction in the rate of endotracheal intubation. And this is a very physiologically sound intervention, uh, easy, to, easy to apply and uh, cost effective. That, that could be a good, a good solution. It's obvious that if you don't have eye flow and you have face mask and IV, you can use face mask and IV, absolutely. In that case, um, please bear in mind that um, the patient has to be strictly monitored uh, with, in terms of respiratory rate, SP, uh, PF ratio, and in that case, you have a reliable estimate but with the ventilator of the exhaled tidal volume. We know that in during face mask and IV, once the patient has a persistently high a, a tidal volume measured without leaks. So we, you can just check for leaks and see the measured tidal volume. You check that the inspired tidal volume is the same as the expired tidal volume. And in that case, you don't have leaks with face mask. If you see that this value exceeds the 9, 10 milliliter per kilo of predicted body weight, in that case, the risk that the patient will need endotracheal intubation is greater than 80%. So in that case, my suggestion again is to provide intratracheal intubation. So I think that in um, during the pandemic, we learned that we can use uh, in, in emergency situations, we use anything we had because we have to keep patients alive. Okay. But we learn a lot and what we have learned should guide us to uh, try to find the optimal strategy. And I think that there is no best strategy for all. I think that the, as everything in medicine, uh, the uh, interventions should be tailored on, on the, the individual patient. So in the best case scenario you can choose, my suggestion would be to give a try um, uh, in the, with the helmet and uh, I flow for the escalation for winning. If you have the helmet, I think that I flow alone could be better than face mask and IV plus I flow. 
But if you only have face mask and IV, you can give a try, but please monitor your patients and not to delay, not delay the drug intubation. This is the real message of the study. Right. So the, the critical decision really is the, uh, the escalation to invasive yes. uh, and, support no matter yes. what. And I think that um, one, other, one other critical point is that um, we have learned in the, the last 20 years that uh, we, have, we, uh, we have a series of bundles, no? So we have the prone position when, once the patient is intubated, um, the use of low tidal volume, maybe the use of paralysis for the initial 24, 48 hours, maybe it could be, be beneficial in the very early phase especially to control tidal volume and avoid um, uh, armful, uh, armful uh, asynchronies like bread stacking, double cycling, things like that. So the outcome of intubated patients is not so bad. So we don't have to fear so much intubation because we have, bund we have bundles like low tidal volume and prone position that could really improve outcome. Mm. The, mess, the general message is, yes, give a try with non-invasive support, but monitor your patient, and in case of failure, do not fear endotracheal intubation. Use low tidal volume and prone position. Monitor the patient with the driving pressure, plateau pressure, and uh, go and prone. Thank you. Um, earlier, you described about predetermined criteria for intubating patients that were on non-invasive respiratory support. Could you share with us what, what those criteria were? Um, I know that some, some people have been using the ROCS criteria, the HACOR scores, but um, could you share with our listeners what, what your criteria were in your study? Okay, um, okay. let's see. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the ROCS index. <laughs> For, for, for audience, the ROX is um, mm, um, an index which has been proposed and validated by a very good friend of mine, Oriol, Oriol Roca, working okay. in Spain. And um, this is the ratio of SpO2 FiO2 divided by uh, respiratory rate. So um, we know that uh, and, uh, rocks between about between three between three point five and point and four point. So the highest is the rocks. The less severe is the patient. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, the lowest is the rocks. The most severe is the patient. And um, there, are, there, there, are, there have been some studies, not on COVID-19, there is, there is one in COVID-19, published by Jean Damien Ricard on intensive care medicine. And they propose a threshold about uh, 3.544. 4. But the point is that the, the issue of the rocks is that uh, um, it critically depends on the used flow. So the rocks index in the original paper by Yoru Roca, was validated with a gas flow with the high flow of 30 liters per minute. Mm -hmm. So that numbers are essentially um, um, valid once you use the rocks, once you use high flow with, uh, 30 liter, with 30 liters per minute, which is not very common. We are used to using the high flow with 60 liters, which is the maximum flow, 50, 60 liters, which is the flow that allows to exert the, the best benefit from my flow. In that case, the threshold could be a bit higher, obviously, uh, because you have an effect on oxygenation and you can go to five. I think that um, like any other parameter, uh, one important issue could be the trend. So if you see a worsening trend in the ROCS index in the first six, 12, 48, 48, 24 hours, yes, that could be the case. Bear in mind that the ROCS index works with the high flow and has not been validated under any uh, other form of respiratory support. The ACR scale is interesting because it, it includes um, a series of parameters. It can be calculated at the bedside, but that index is been, has been validated with face mask and IV. 
So I think it is applicable to face mask and NIV. In mm, okay. what we used, what we used, the predefined criteria that we used for endotracheal intubation in our study, well, we tried to be as consistent as possible with other randomized trials. I think one issue is that there, there, is, there should be an agreement between investigators on this topic to try to keep the uh, criteria for intubation quite constant across the studies. So what we had, uh, uh, it was the combination of at least two of two factors. One of the following, let's say, dyspnea, tachypnea, persistent hypoxemia, so lack of improvement in hypoxemia, and other conditions not strictly related to the, to the uh, respiratory status. So changing mental status, um, shock, and uh, in, in, cap in loss of uh, capability to clear secretions due to uh, uh, due to um, deficits in the in the in the in the calf. Um, I think this is very clinical. Um, you, you can I think you can choose one approach. But the, the, the really important issue is that uh, people are aware that patients should be monitored. This is my big fear. And this is also what comes out from larger observational studies in which sometimes patients are put on iFlow or NIV, you put 100% and you stay there for one week, okay? Or five days. This is not the way to use non-invasive support. The way to use non-invasive support is to uh, tailor a FIO2, try to reduce as much as possible. And if you see that you cannot reduce, if you see persistent dyspnea, if you see persistent fatigue, the case is the need for endotracheal intubation and protective ventilation. So I think it is very clinical. Uh, for obviously, if you perform a randomized trial, you have some, you need something to, to standardize the approach in the two groups. Also because these, these, these trials are not blinded. Mm -hmm. Unavoidably, you cannot do blind, blind studies. So our open label and if the intervention um, is open label, you have to have some sort of control of the endpoint if your endpoint is a clinical decision. Um, I think that in term, I think in terms of clinical practice, anything is good. The important is that uh, there is some sort of monitoring, and you pay attention to to the different to to the trend of the patient over time. And after that, um, there is some. I always say there is some art in medicine, and sometimes the decision to intubate is part of the art of, of medicine. We have seen a lot of patients where we were really, really hypoxemic, not that dyspneic. So we kept in high floor helmet for a while and one day they recovered. So maybe the presence of only one criterion of the, of the, of, for intubation, like the persistent hypoxemia, should not be the sole, sole criteria that drives endotracheal intubation, but once you have a persistent hypoxemia, so PF ratio below 100, together with high respiratory rate, together with dyspnea, together, together to recruitment of accessory respiratory muscles, in that case, do not fear intubation and go for it. I think, I think that, was a, um, that was very valuable to hear on my part. Actually, I was just thinking to myself that the moment that we publish this um, podcast, I'm going to be sharing it right away with my colleagues that are seeing the patients outside the intensive care unit because um, this is where the um, where we trip up. We trip up usually yep. in the non-invasive respiratory support and the interface or the switch over to intubation. Um, this, is, this is the big issue because... Pretty Oh, this is something to always to consider and keep in mind. The ANIVO trial has been performed in the intensive care unit, where the monitoring was the monitoring of the intensive care unit. Right. Okay. 
So um, using that kind of support, like the helmet and IV, outside the intensive care unit in the medical world, I will be, I would be very, very cautious of this. I would be very cautious of this. If I can have an, I can provide an advice for, for, to be, for safety. If you want to try helmet and IV, at least at the beginning, and you have a learning curve, in, in, uh, as in everything. It's not difficult. Uh, you have to uh, know the technique and uh, there are some tricks on this and there are videos on YouTube, so you can learn, but uh, please do it in the intensive care unit. If it is not possible, if it is not possible to do it, do it in the intensive care unit, and you need to uh, support these patients in the medical world where the monitoring cannot be the same as the intensive care unit, please go with the eye flow. This is my advice. So if you have, if you want to try something new, please, I think the, the best advice I can give is to try something new in the intensive in care the unit ICU. with the intensive care unit monitoring. Well, thank you for that. Um, this is very, I, I try to be as honest as possible. I'm a great student. You imagine that I, I think that helmet works, but well, helmet, for, for, for what we know, Helmet may work, may work because uh, we are talking about a, a, a single study um, which was performed in the intensive care unit and we had a signal on a secondary outcome. So before uh, um, stating that it can be used in every context and it is beneficial, we need more data. And at least regarding helmet NIV, we have no data about the use of it outside the intensive care unit. We have data about the use of CPAP, helmet CPAP, outside the intensive care unit. This is coming from the north of Italy, uh, the group led by Giacomo Bellani. But um, the context is a context in which they uh, also in medical wards, they were, they were very expert in the use of helmet CPAP. And every day, an intensive care unit physician had a round for all patients that were managed in helmet CPAP. So in any case, please monitor your patient. Do, do whatever you believe it can work, but please monitor your patient. Oh, well, there you have it. So the uh, the monitoring and the yes, absolutely. I think making. it's crucial. Yes, it's the most critical. Um, I know we have already um, discussed so much, but um, and we have. Um, I'm amazed at how much you have already shared with us. But um, we are at the end of our podcast, <laughs> and um, but and I know you've said already a lot. But uh, do you have any, any final advice to our listeners? regarding um, the topic that we have today? In my final advice is that um, I, I, I think that, that the non-invasive respiratory support uh, in the context of hypoxemic respiratory failure is still an open issue. Um, hopefully, we will have a bit more time in the future to um, address this issue with more calm. So we, there has been a rush to, to provide answers to because we had the COVID-19 pandemic. So my hope for the world, for all physicians and all patients in the world, is that this nightmare ends. And uh, obviously, our aim as a scientist is to find uh, uh, the optimal approach for the single patient. So I think that based on the monitoring itself, we will find a way with research and the support of clinicians, we will find a way to um, identify for each single patient uh, the optimal treatment. So my, what I see for the future, my, let's say, innuendo will be to um, identify uh, some sort of tailored intervention between the eye flow and the helmet, and maybe to, um, once we, in the future, we will, hopefully we can demonstrate that in a specific group of patients, the helmet may work better, at least in, in, the, in the initial phase. Um, 
Um, and may, my new end is that this technique may become widespread also in Asia and uh, in other countries in the world abroad. Yes. Uh, thank you again, um, Domenico. Um, it's been my great pleasure. It's a great privilege to be able to speak with you about this. Um, so this was uh, another edition of the AVF podcast, Tips and Tricks. Um, we had with us Dr. Domenico Luca Greco, and we thank him. And um, until the next time.